black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. And I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me, and this look of I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was he was he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 
And she's pretty ag- aggressive girl. She said, she laughed and said, I don't know what you're going to do with that, but I don't think whatever it is that's circling us right now, <laughs> I don't think that's going to do anything. Let's leave. So he started the car and began to inch it back and forth, turn it around in the cul-de-sac. He finally got it headed in the right direction down the dirt road coming off the top of the hill. And as they drove off, uh, she turned around, and I think I mentioned it was a convertible. She turned around and looked over the trunk lid, and this thing stepped out into the cul-de-sac under the light. She said it was somewhere in the neighborhood of eight feet tall, maybe nine. Um, massive broad shoulders, very long arms. She said that the hair, now it was in silhouette. And the reason it was in silhouette is there was a street light that was behind it. So she really couldn't make out facial features or whatever. But she said it was extremely, the silhouette was extremely muscular and it had long hair on its arms hanging down. And at that point, she started screaming at the young man that she was with that night and started pounding him in the shoulder with her fist and screaming, drive, drive. It's right behind us. Just drive. And uh, so he hit the gas pedal and they went as fast as they could down the road and got out of sight and they never saw it again. I don't know if you want me telling the rest of the story about what happened the next day or within a couple of days after. Yeah, please do. Uh, Well, the park that's at the bottom of the hill, Tom Wallace Park, She came to me and said, you know, something very strange happened the next day or the day following. Um, They found a woman dead hanging in the tree. And there was a big tree there and she was up and somehow her arms and legs were placed so in the tree that the body wouldn't fall out. And that her abdomen had been torn open and that uh, intestines uh, were gone partially eaten, gone. And so the police department moved in, closed that area. And then from that time on, and this would have been in the early 60s, from that time on, they um, closed the park. They had a curfew. You could not go in that park after dark. And I found that very interesting because on a a Sasquatch show that I was watching, they – a man owned a lot of goats, and he saw a Sasquatch in his backyard – And when he turned on the lights, it ran off down a trail. Well, the next morning, he got up and started looking for his goats and couldn't find them. Went down the trail. He found all of his goats, but they were all up in the trees dead with their abdomens torn open and um, partially eaten or gone. And I just found that very interesting. And this lady that worked for me, she was elderly. She didn't watch anything like that, had no way of knowing. And I just found that very, very interesting. So that's one show. That's 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 one story that for your show that I think would be interesting. And then um, the next one comes from a guy that was actually my song leader. And and I'm really excited that you're going to have Alan on your broadcast in the very near future to tell the story. So I'm just going to give little bits and pieces. I don't want to I don't want to steal his thunder because he is excited about coming forward. He told me the story over 20 years ago. And I told him I would not tell anybody, and you already know this part, Wes. Um, yeah. Called him yesterday and told him, hey, I'm thinking about going on this um, Sasquatch Chronicles and telling your story. I won't tell him who you are. And, he, he, you know, shockingly, he said, you know, Randy, I I think I'm ready to come forward. I think I'm ready to tell my story. So, you know, your audience is in for a, a real thrill ride. Uh, it's one of the best I've heard. Uh, he and his uh, friend, a very dear friend, they grew up lifelong friends together. They were in their late teens, and they were on the Green River. Uh, you you can Google it, Green River Lake. They were filling the lake at that time and uh, making a large lake there in the area. They dammed up the creek and or the river, and, and the lake was filling up. So a lot of the cave systems in that area, and there's a lot of cave systems in Kentucky, uh, they started filling up. They just happened to be out one day target practicing. They took several pop cans, went to the Green River. They would go upriver, throw the cans in, then run back down to a, a clearing and stand and wait on the cans, and then they would shoot at the cans as they went by. Well, Alan's gun jammed, so they walked back up to their car, which was a Corvair. This was like 1969, 1970, and they uh, they were clearing the shell out of the gun and getting it unjammed, and 
all of a sudden the trees, right, the clearing where they'd come from, they had to walk around a large stand of trees to get back to the car and across the field. They looked up because they heard a noise and the trees were swaying and these trees that were three, four inches around were snapping off uh, at the top. And so Alan's friend said, man, who let the elephant out? And they said, well, let's go check it out. These are, these are country boys. These guys grew up in the country. Uh, they couldn't think of any creature that could do that. So they jogged back down across the field and then very quietly came around those trees into an opening. And as they came around, this Sasquatch, he called it a creature at the time. As a matter of fact, they called it a monster for years because they didn't know what it was, um, turned around to look at them. And these guys were excellent marksmen and Alan's friend turned and pointed the gun and just pop, 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 pop five times right in the chest. Every one of them hitting their target. Uh, Alan told me back then, 20 years ago, he said it almost sounded like the bullets were hitting water, said, and this thing became very stunned and it was standing on a deadfall and it fell off the back. And so they just lost it. They went into complete shock. Uh, the one friend started yelling, we've killed our crazy uncle. We've killed him. We've killed him. Uh, he got in a monkey suit and tried to scare us. And, and so Alan told him, said, I don't know what we've killed, but it's not my uncle. They actually kind of held on to one another, grown guys near 20 years old and, and made their way with their 22 rifles over to the deadfall. And when they got very close, this thing jumped up and took off running and they put it in B for boogie and took off the other way and started running for their lives. And you'll just have to hear Alan tell it. I mean, he said, uh, you know, I felt like my legs were outrunning my body. I felt like my body was actually leaning back. I was moving so fast and so hard. And uh, so that story is very exciting. The fact that they were uh, within 30 or 40 feet of this eyeball to eyeball. He's going to be able to give a good description. Um, the thing actually went down and was in shock for a moment or two. Um, may have even passed out. I don't know. But when it came up on its feet, they all went different directions. And it goes further than that. They tracked it. They, they're just other things. I don't want to give it all away. Um, yeah, I but understand. You, that, yeah. And so what's really exciting about this is it's been – 50 years ago this year that they saw it, the legend of the Green River Monster was born on that day. A lot of people in town made fun of them, but a lot of the high school kids believed them. And so it's been a popular parking spot for 50 years where guys take their girlfriends down there and look for the Green River Monster. They don't know that they're looking for a Sasquatch. They've never heard. So it's going to be a great reveal, um, I think, and you're going to love having Alan on your show. Yeah, I can't wait to have him on. Thank you for steering him towards me. And I, I found it interesting because when he shared this with you, he didn't say Bigfoot. He didn't say Sasquatch. He was saying monster to you. You know, we saw a monster. Yes. Uh, actually, I'm the one that told him. When he told me that the tops of the trees were swaying, and these were 15, 20-foot trees, and they were breaking off up high, I said, well, that's a Bigfoot. And he said, well, how do you know that? And I said, well, I'm going to find a video that I watched many years ago, and it's about some – uh, hunters that went up into Canada and they were looking for uh, the legend of the Sasquatch and they hired some Indian guides to take them up into this forbidden area. And the Indian guides told them, these Native American Indians told them, said, we will take you as far as where the tops of the trees are broken off. We will not go past that because that's where they mark their territory. They don't want you coming beyond the trees that are broken off. And so I told Alan, I said, you know, I think this thing was probably ran out of its cave system. It had to find a new area to live in because, uh, you know, 8,210 acres were being flooded and it was marking new territory. And I think that's what was happening. And I mentioned to you just briefly that I have a theory that, you know, you have a lot of people on your show. I've listened to many, many, many of the podcasts that you've done. And some people come on and say, well, I think they're nice. And other people come on and say, well, I think they can be violent. And others say, well, there's a certain type of Sasquatch th that, that's nice. And then you get into the coneheads and maybe they're more violent. But here's what I believe. I believe that the further you get into their territory, the more violent they become. 
I'm a really nice guy. I've got a very long fuse. But if I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and you're in my house, my kel shotgun's coming out. And you may not make it out of the house alive if you're standing in my living yeah. room. Okay? And I just think that this, this is a theory that, you know, I'm not saying everybody has to agree with, but it's just my theory after all of the stories I've heard that when you pass their boundaries, trees bent over, trees broken off at the top. When you pass that area and you keep moving, and most people out in the woods don't know whether they're moving further into their territory or further away. Uh, I think if a person is on the edge of a territory of a Sasquatch, okay, uh, that Sasquatch may be congenial. He he may look you over and walk away. Uh, you get a half a mile into their territory and they believe that it's their territory. You may have rocks thrown at you, logs thrown at you. Uh, you may get growls. You may get bluff charged. There just may be so many things that could happen. I, I think with these homes that people move into, and they're there for a time, and these things are beating on their house, throwing rocks on their house. And uh, I think that those Sasquatch probably for years, if, if if they had Sasquatch families, generations that were raised there, they may consider that their territory, and that's why they're uh, attacking the houses. Yeah, it could be. I mean, I, I think there is times where th these things just get set off for no reason. But I like your theory. Uh, going back to your first story about uh, the guts being ripped out, one thing that, and, and again, no, I don't know that anyone's actually seen a Sasquatch do it, but we assume that they do it. You'll see um, where deer kills, they take the guts, but they leave everything else. So it's, I thought that was interesting when you were telling that first story about how uh, the woman had her guts ripped out, then the goats. You'll find that with a lot of deer kills. Um, and I've seen pictures of it. I've heard accounts of it. Um, or you'll find where hunters will kill a deer, and then they'll gut it, leave the guts, and then the guts are gone. They'll come back the next day, and the guts are gone. Uh, and obviously, there's other animals that could get to it, but um, it, they seem to take weird parts of animals that you know we wouldn't eat. Well, you know, it might be, and this is going to sound gross, but it might be a smoothie for them. And and you never know. I mean, it's, you know, I've, I've, I've heard on podcasts where they're tearing the legs off and walking away with legs and on and on. Um, and then you hear of where the guts are just ripped out. And this is pre-digestive stuff. And if you've got an older Sasquatch that has lost most of his molars and some of his canines, you would, it's just only natural that they would go after something that's already been chewed up. It's their smoothie. That's a good point. I never thought of that. What What do you think that Sasquatch is, Randy? I mean, you've listened to the show. What's your opinion as far as, because I'm going to lead in with another question on that, but I'm just curious on what your opinion on Sasquatch is first. Well, you mentioned earlier that I'm a pastor. Uh, I've traveled all over the United States for seven years of my life, full-time, 51 weeks out of the year. And then I was supernaturally called to Louisville, Kentucky. My wife nor I are from here. I was born in Texas, raised in Oklahoma. My wife was born in Minnesota. So we came just out of obedience um, to this area of the country, and um, I'm going to go to the book of Genesis. A lot of your uh, followers are very aware of Genesis chapter 6, where the sons of God came down and took unto themselves the daughters of men um, and had sex with them, and out of them the Nephilim were born, or the men of renown, or giants. So now you're into the realm of demons, fallen angels. When it says the sons of God, uh, there the word in the Hebrew is Elohim, uh, and that never refers to humanity. If if the, if Moses was going to write about humanity, he would have used Adama, which is where we get the name Adam, and Adama means humankind. So many times in the five books of the law, you've got the word man, and it's Adama. Uh, you know, man shall not live by bread alone. We could just go on and on. It doesn't necessarily mean a male individual. That's the word Aish in the original. Adama means humanity. So when Moses was writing about the sons of God taking the daughters of men unto themselves, he was referring to a supernatural being. He was referring to the fallen angels, and this is where it came from. And, and uh, you know, we talked a little bit about this. Um, the Bible says Noah was righteous in all of his generations. That's um, in Genesis 6. 
And the prophecy to Adam and Eve were that her seed would bruise the head of the serpent seed. Okay, there would be a war, a seed war. In other words, your offspring is going to bruise the head of their offspring. And so what we find in Genesis chapter 6 is that uh, the estimation is, is that the demonic realm started contaminating the bloodlines all over so that there could not be a Messiah. And so it gives a lot of legitimate reason as to why God would flood the earth because it says he was righteous or right or pure in all of his generations, meaning that there was a man left on the planet whose bloodline had not been contaminated by supernatural beings or by incubus succubus. And so there wasn't any demonic DNA in his bloodline, so he saved that bloodline, okay? Um, But I, I will go into this. I think that in that realm, and I know that not everybody that tunes into your podcast, believe in that realm. I've actually seen demons, uh, seen angels. Uh, I'm not going to back away from that. Uh, You've got people on that claim they've seen Sasquatch. I've seen demons and angels. I've seen physical manifestations. Uh, Made me a believer real quick. These spirits, these demons, um, uh, these incubus, succubus, they're demons of lust, okay? They, They thrive on... Uh, passion and and thrive on pleasure. And uh, who's to say, and I I believe personally, that these spirits uh, not only had sex with women, they had sex with animals. So, you know, when they had sex with women, giants were the outcome. You know, we've, we've talked not you and I, but I've heard podcasts about goat men and dog men and, and werewolves and on and on. And uh, they're, they're always large, extremely muscular, you know, not too far from where I live, less than 10 miles from where I live. There's legend of the goat man down by a railroad trestle, not too far from where I live. I uh, don't know how valid that is. Don't know anybody that's seen it in the last 10 or 20 years, but a lot of people claim to have seen this goat man with horns and on and on. And uh, so these spirits had sex with women and ended up with giants. And um, the Bible calls them men's of, men of renown and go all the way up to 30-something feet tall. I don't think it's unusual that these spirits of lust would not copulate with other type animals and end up with the same results. So you think it's more of an abomination? Uh, man, the abomination, that's a pretty, pretty strong word. Um, I, I do. I do believe that it's n- not obviously not natural. Uh, does does that mean that they are all completely evil? Uh, I believe that they have a demonic DNA to them. Uh, whether or not they are evil in nature, all of them. Uh, that, that's that's hard to say. You know. I mean. I mean, there are full blown witches that run. Uh, covens and and they become mothers and then grandmothers and uh, I've had to deal with their children or their grandchildren that are suffering from demonic activity in their homes and everything and, it, and it's and it's a generational curse um, it's a generational stronghold in their family that has to be broken and these are good people that just have a lot going on in their DNA. It's interesting because some guys in the military who claim they were part of kill teams, I asked him one time, what are these things? And he said, they're abominations. And I was like, oh, that's interesting because that's a biblical term. I wonder why you use that term. But, you know, when you start reading and you and I were talking about this uh, the other night, uh, the book of Enoch, the book of Jasper, they, they all go into – there was a lot of weird things running around. If you buy into it, there was a lot of, not only was there the Nephilim, but there was these other weird creatures out running around, what we call cryptids today. And the Sumerians, like I always talk about Greek mythology, you know, all the weird half man, half horse, uh, half man, half bull, um, all the different, you know, the centaurs, all the different uh, creatures that they name. Uh, And everyone thinks it's just some guy in Greece came up with this, theory of this folklore, he didn't actually come up with it. He stole it from the Egyptians. The Egyptians stole it from the Sumerians. So where does this come from? I mean, everyone's kind of stealing and borrowing from everyone. 
and they're talking about these half man, half this. And I, I just find it interesting that today we're starting to see more and more weird creatures. Like I had Jessica and Tori on uh, the last show, and they were talking about how uh, they had run into, you know, the, they call it the rake or the ghoul. Um, and that creature is being seen more and more and more. I mean, I've had law enforcement see this thing. They seem to be coming out of nowhere, like the dog man. Uh, the dog man goes back, you know, Anubis and uh, werewolves and behind every legend, there's some truth and it concerns me a little bit. Now, maybe it might be, um, there's the communications more open. Now we talk on the internet, everyone has access to the internet. Um, and we talk about what we've seen. Is it that, is it that there's more communication and people are more willing to come forward and say what they saw? Or are people seeing more of these freaks coming out? You know, half man, half dog isn't natural. I don't care what anyone says. Um, Sasquatch doesn't even seem natural. None of these things seem natural, but they seem to be appearing and it's somewhat alarming. Same thing with the UFOs and the aliens and all this other stuff. You know, back when I was um, a kid, and, you know, growing up, if you said you saw aliens or you believed in aliens or you saw a UFO, you were crazy. Now, not so much. Fox News did a poll um, about how I think it's like over 50% of Americans believe in UFOs and aliens and actually believe we're being visited. And the American audience is pretty cynical. And so for, that's a pretty large percentage. And so you're starting to see more and more of these weird cryptids showing up. You're starting to see more of this alien activity. And when you go into outside of the Bible, you start reading some of these Apocrypha texts. I don't know if that's the right term or not, but like the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jasser, some of these other texts are outside of the Bible. You'll find things that seem to relate to what we're seeing today. We just call it something else. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do exactly. And, you know, the I guess the question is, is, is there an increase in frequency uh, of visitation from these dimensions or has our communication across the earth just gotten better? It could be a little of both. Um, you know, when I was a boy growing up, I'm 62 years old. When I was a boy growing up, you know, we had a television that had a knob and rabbit ears and we had three channels and they all went off at 1130 or 12 at night. And they didn't come back on till 6, 6.30 in the morning. Um, that was, you know, not uncommon. Um, we had only so many radio channels locally to pick from on the radio station. Um, I was around when FM came in. Uh, I was around when the 8-track came in. Um, the printing press as well. Um, you know, the, the, not, I wasn't around when the penny, printing press came in, but I want to bring it up. Yeah. That, I was going to ask you, I was like, really? I don't yeah, think you're yeah, that yeah. old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was a little slip of the lip there. Uh, I wasn't around for that, but, but my point of that is, is that it, there weren't near as many printing companies when I was a boy as there was when I got in my early thirties. Okay. Yeah. And books, the flood of books. As printing became easier and more digitized and computerized, it just became so much easier. There's not near as many print shops today as there was years ago because it's all computerized and on and on. Um, the Internet has made our world a lot smaller. And I think that, you know, uh, the reason that I became open to the fact that there might be a lot of things in the world we can't explain is I actually had a UFO encounter when I was uh, 14 years old. And it was very unique in my opinion, um, what happened to me, but, um, that opened me up. I mean, I was like, okay, I've had some things happen to me that I cannot explain. And I didn't tell anybody about it probably until I was in my early forties. I didn't even bring it up. Tell us about um, it. Will you, you saw you have, okay. tell us um, about it. No, I, I don't mind at all. I was, um, now, you know, <laughs> I'm going to get crucified by the religious culture around me for telling the story, um, but it doesn't matter, man. I'm, I'm, I've earned my I've earned my say. I've been in this a long time, and I really don't care what anybody else thinks. I know what happened. Um, I was 14 years old, uh, so that would have been 1969, 1970, and I lived in a house with five other boys, six boys all together, and my brother was out of town and I was sleeping in his room 
on his bed because we lived in a small house and I had to share a bed with another brother. So I got a chance to sleep on my own. And, um, so I went in his room in our room, we had no windows, but in my brother's room, there was a window at the head of his bed and it was four o'clock in the morning. And I don't know any other way to say this. I may have heard this on your podcast. I heard it within the last six months. I've tried to explain it. I was switched on. I was not asleep. I don't know where I was, don't know where I had been, but all I know is I bolted up in his bed and I was wide awake. And I knew that I had been wide awake, but I didn't know where or what was going on. I let my eyes adjust to the room and I'm listening very carefully for any movement in the house because I'm thinking, well, the reason I've bolted up this alert is because maybe somebody's in the house and going to do us harm. And so I'm listening and nothing it was summertime. We didn't have air conditioning in the home. And I thought, I need to look outside. So I turned and the window was open above my bed or at the head of my bed. The window was open. I turned and looked out the window and there was a solid white sphere. I want to be very careful to say sphere. It was not an orb. It was not, it was not plasma in nature. It looked like a glass sphere full of beautiful white fog or smoke. Um, it was probably six to eight feet in diameter, probably about 200 feet in the air. And the angle of it is what impressed me. It was at the exact angle outside the window where it could see through the window and see me laying on the bed. So I put my elbows on the window seal and started looking at this uh, sphere and wondering what in the world am I looking at? And there was, it, there was no sound outside whatsoever. There was no wind moving. And for Oklahoma, that is a rare thing. There was zero wind, a crystal clear not, night, not a cloud in the sky. And it was just midnight black all around this with this thing illuminated from within. It was actually very beautiful, and I'm watching it, and it is, it's not swaying, it's not rotating, there is zero sound, and this is back in the day before you had very many UFO encounters or anybody reporting on them, um, zero sound, and it's setting in the sky like it's hanging from a string or sitting on a ledge. It motionless, and I'm looking at this. I watch it for about eight or nine minutes, and I'm thinking, what am I doing? I've got to tell somebody. Uh, nobody's going to believe me. So my younger brother, Robert, was laying in the bed across the room, and I raced over and began to shake him. Well, he was just dead to the world, so I literally had to start kind of punching on him and hitting on him and slapping him in the face, and he kind of came up, defended himself, and I said, stop come to the window. Just, I'm sorry I woke you up, but you got to come see this. So he comes over, comes to the windowsill with me, uh, puts his elbows up there too. And we're looking out at the screen and he says, what in the world is that? And I said, I don't know. Now what's strange is when his face came to the screen and started looking through the screen, this thing started moving. It didn't move at all while I was looking at it. But when he, when there were two heads in the window, this thing started moving ever so slowly at at an angle away from me um, and going up like at, at a uh, 45 degrees away from me very slowly. This sphere got up to the stars or appeared to be about the same size as the stars and it started twinkling. And I locked on it as much as I could, but I eventually, you know, once I looked away and looked back, I couldn't tell which one it was. And uh, that night, I made a promise to myself that I was never going to forget it. I would never, ever let anybody talk me out of it, um, convince me that I didn't see it, and uh, I would carry it for the rest of my life. And I have. Uh, this is the first time I've gone this public. I've told a few friends here and there, but I've never gone this public. Um, and so there are things out there we cannot explain. 
uh, will never be able to explain. Yeah. I know that there are people in the world that if you can't explain it from A to Z, they're just not going to believe. They're going to shut it completely out. Um, well, that makes for a pretty dull life. Yeah, I agree. You know, I had um, a member only show and and I had the soldier on from any what he was talking about when he was in Iraq and very similar to almost identical to what you described. And I'd never heard anyone else describe it uh, like that, including with the smoke. That's what caught my attention wow. when you were telling the story, uh, because they were and it's a long story, but they were there was three of them. There was one huge one and two smaller ones. And he describes the exact same thing. He said it was uh, uh, this real soft light, but it was a ball a sphere and it had smoke and it hovered over this infantry group as they were trying to enter the city. Um, I think they were camped down for the night and these three things flew over and he didn't know what they were. What, what do you think that thing was, Randy, that you saw that night? Well, from my perspective as a young man, I thought I was probably looking at something from another world. But again, we go back to the Nephilim and, and, and demonic intervention. And, you know, there's a real popular theory that these ships or these UFO sightings that are showing up are not extraterrestrial, they're interdimensional. I probably lean more toward that than I do extraterrestrial. I, I probably lean to the fact that there is a race of demonic hybrids that have, have been around for thousands of years now since the flood um, that are advanced in technology. And I do believe that our government knows a little bit about them. Um, and I, I also believe uh, that there may be a coming out where they come out and present themselves as, you know, there, there's some Jesuit priests that have said, uh, no slam on the Catholic Church, but but they have said that they believe that Jesus is an alien hybrid. And I think that's a horrible, horrible um, deception that that may very well in the very near future be played out upon the earth. And uh, they may come forward and say, this is the father of Jesus right here, and he's an alien. I think there's some danger there. But anyway, that's kind of my take on it. I kind of lean towards that, too. Uh, and I've never heard anyone else really go into that. I mean, I've had that same theory as you do. Depending on whether people believe in the Bible or not, you can go back. It's fascinating to read some of it. And if you just get general concepts, even stuff outside of the Bible, like the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jesus, you start going into some of their writings, you know, ancient writings. Uh, one of the things you talked about bloodlines and um, what were the Nephilim? The Nephilim were hybrids. And I find it odd that when people get taken by these quote-unquote aliens, 90% of the time, it's for, hey, look, we created a hybrid. They're, they're creating some weird hybrids, and then they're shown their hybrid. Um, yeah. I've heard many accounts like that, and it's troublesome. It's very troublesome. Well, that world is very real. Uh, I've had very, I've had a lot of encounters. Um, I don't like the term exorcist. Uh, so to speak, but I have done a lot of exorcisms, not because I went looking for it, but because desperate people came to me. And uh, through the years, through the 37 years now of full-time ministry, I've cast out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of demons. And um, they're always up to no good, always. And so I think that th there may be some dark things on the horizon. I don't know if you've followed um, the large binocular telescope on Mount Graham or not that's owned by the Jesuit priests and ran by the Jesuit priests. Yeah, aren't uh, they looking, that's pretty interesting. Aren't they looking for um, – aren't they looking for something in the sky? I can't remember what it's called. They're looking for something in particular. Yeah, are you talking about Wormwood? I think are you it, talking about – Yeah, Wormwood, but they're also looking for um, – I know Wormwood's in Revelations, but they're also yeah. looking for um, – Anyway, I guess I shouldn't have said it because I, I should have been more prepared before I opened my mouth. But, yeah, explain that, if you would, to the audience. Well, if you're talking about the LBT, the Large Binocular Telescope, yeah. um, they've been running it for years, and it's an infrared telescope. And they've got a, a pretty large computer. And you can look all this up online. It's there. They've got a pretty large computer between the two binoculars, I mean, between the two telescopes that makes it a binocular telescope. The 
the computer that synchronizes them and runs it in for red, the name of that computer is Lucifer. Yeah. And they don't make any bones about it, which is really bizarre that Jesuit priests would run something like that. And they openly say that they see UFOs through the infrared flying all the time and doing 90 degree turns at impossible speeds and on and on and on. They don't make any bones about it. They they say, yes, they're out there. We believe in them. And again, there's a connection between them and the Vatican. There's a book out. Uh, do you mind if I reference the book? No, not at all. Okay. The name of the book is Exo Vaticana. Exo Vaticana. And I think the guy's name is Tom Hall. But anyway, he is a preacher that has done a lot of research and actually gone to Mount Graham, invited there by the Jesuits and, and interviewed them and talked with them. And he lays out where he thinks the church is going officially with this storyline. And it looks like they're leaning very heavily to accepting beings from quote unquote outer space, which again, I believe they're inter interdimensional, but, and, and that Mary was seated by an alien, which I think is a horrible deception. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I want to get into some of the stranger demonic encounters. I wanted to ask you, and you may not have looked this up or not. Did you ever read about them digging up Nimrod? No, I did not. I'll have to send you some stuff on that. It's pretty fascinating. Um, okay. It, it, but we can, we can come back to that. But if you would, um, and I know demons have certain names. Um, I had a lady on one time, or no, I didn't have her on. I, the two brothers I always talk about all the time on the show, uh, they had a quote unquote spirit medium come out and, you know, she claimed to know demons by first name. And I when it, they had asked her, what are these things? And she said that they're coming up out of the earth, referring to Sasquatch. They're coming up out of the earth. And I thought that was a very strange thing for her to say. Um, but I know you've dealt with a lot of uh, demonic encounters. Can you give us some stories as far as what you've dealt with? Sure, I don't mind. Um, I'll tell you a story that happened um, seven, eight years ago now. I'm not great with years, but I'm going to say seven or eight years ago, I had a lady from another country come and visit our church. And it was an adult Bible study night. Um, we did adult Bible studies back then on Wednesday night, and she came forward immediately after my lesson. And and said, uh, Pastor, would you pray for me? And I said, sure. She said, I'm not feeling well. I've got something going on with my stomach. And so I reached over and put my hand very gently on her forehead and began to pray for her. When I did, her eyes rolled back in her head. All I could see was the whites of her eyes, and she started growling like a man. And, of course, I, it was not my first rodeo. I knew right then, okay, it's going to be a long evening. So I assembled a, a very quick team of people that – I've worked with in the past, a number of the people that are with me have been with me 10, 15 years, and I've trained them. And I said, I need you guys to stay a little while. So we told the congregation, you guys might want to go out and, you know, go to the restaurant, wherever you're going to go and uh, leave. Uh, we've got some situations here we have to deal with. So she had two girls. One was six and one was three at the time. And I assigned another young married couple to take the two daughters uh, to avoid any trauma on them, to take them to a different part of the building. They walked out of the sanctuary and closed that door, went across the hallway and into a smaller um, room that we use for venues that seats about 100 people. And so we had tables in there with toys. And so this couple went in and closed all the doors and uh, gave them a safe place to play. So we started dealing with this woman. and and. Uh, when you're dealing with demons, the way I do it, I'm not saying this has to be done every time, but I ask the entity, what is your name? I think I was shocked the first few times um, that I did that because of the names, uh, suicide, hatred, unforgiveness, rage, murder, mayhem. Uh, and these are legitimate names that they, 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 their names are their assignments. It's what they've come oh, to promote. Okay, so that, so their are, names are their assignments. Can I Go ask ahead. you, Randy, you had to make it off. So the demons aren't screwing with you, and but they're giving you what their title is as opposed to their name. 
Well, their, their name is their name is their title. I mean, that's what they do. So, yeah. you know, my name is suicide. My name is uh, well, like for example, in the Bible, my name is Legion, for we are many. Okay, which happened on Gadara, oh, yeah, right. Island of the Gadarenes. Yeah. Okay, my name is Legion, for we are many. Okay, so we had cast several demons out of this lady, um, and what she had done is she was from. I'm just going to go ahead and say she was from Cuba. And she, so people approached her and said, would you like to live in America? And they said, she said, yes. And I said, well, if you will let us put our spirits in you, then we'll send you for free. And so she went for the session, whatever it was, woke up three days later without any clothes on, laying in their temple and was very demon possessed. And they sent her on to America. So anyway, to make a long story short, we're casting demons out. And I get to one that is mocking us. And another thing that they'll do many times is they will speak in an ancient language. When you say, what is your name? And they'll give you uh, something in an ancient language. Uh, or they'll mock you and say, I don't have to tell you. I'm not coming out. I own this person. Uh, they belong to me. And and so you can't be intimidated. Or they'll say, you don't have the power. They'll laugh at you. They'll cuss you. Um, you don't have the power. Um, you know, better men than you have tried to take me out, on and on. So you just have to stay after it. What is your name? What is your name? And not converse with them. Um, so anyway, after quite a bit of mocking, I got firm and I said, what is your name? And this demon screamed snake. And when it screamed snake, she fell over in the floor and started wiggling like a snake. And, uh, I would say it would have had to have been done with supernatural assistance because I've never seen a body move like that. She literally slithered like a snake across the floor without using her hands or feet. Her hands were down by her side her toes were pointed and she's slithering like a snake. Well, we don't allow, at least my group that I work with, we don't allow a lot of demonstrations. So we just very gently got down beside her and stopped her from slithering without hurting her and held her down. While we're holding her down, um, within 30 seconds, the door swings open and the man that's watching her daughters from the other part of the building comes running across about 40 feet across the front of our altar area and said, what's going on in here? And I looked up at him and I said, why? Why are you asking? He said, because we're watching her daughters and her six-year-old was working with a game, just fell out of her chair and started slithering across the floor like a snake. So when we stopped the mother from slithering like a snake. The daughter simultaneously fell on the floor and began to manifest and slither like a snake. Now, you know, I'm either crazy, I'm three French fries short of a happy meal, uh, my driveway doesn't go all the way to the garage, or I'm telling you the truth. That world is very real. Yeah, no, I believe you. I mean, I, I've actually watched some things on um, uh, on TV, and this was back when it was VHS, and I remember I watched this guy who was possessed. His face started bleeding, and he had all these cuts on his face, and it wasn't his real face. It, like, he morphed. It was yes. like physically, un it, it was impossible for him to do this. And this is an old VHS recording. They, it was like a farmer or something. I'll see if I can dig it up and send it to you. I'm sure you've seen enough in your life. You probably don't want to see it, but... Um, it was fascinating. And then when it was gone, he was back to normal. He wasn't, he didn't have the cuts in his face. He didn't, uh, he wasn't sweating blood. Uh, why, why do you ask their names? Is it to control? Is it a power thing to ask their name or so that you're addressing them? What's the point of asking their name? Well, I'm not brilliant. Uh, I, I, when I started having demonic encounter after demonic encounter, um, people needing freedom, um, I wasn't the most successful in the beginning. They can be very intimidating. They can mock you and make you feel like, yeah, maybe they're right. You know, I've been trying to get this demon to come out for the last 20 minutes. It's not coming out, and it's laughing at me, spitting in my face and telling me I don't have the power. Maybe they're right, you know. Um, so I started picking up materials um, on people that were successful 
or claim to be successful. And one of the um, most successful in the last 120 years, the man's name is Derek Prince. And so I read his book and um, uh, They Shall Expel Demons, I think is the name of the book. And so I read that book and uh, he used that technique. He said, if you get their name, then you can command them by name to come out and they must obey. If you if you command them to come out in the name of Jesus and call them by name, they have to come out. It's really strange. I mean, you know, there are some things that I didn't find in books that, like, for example, I was working with one man and casting demons out of him, and they literally, the demons, started arguing with each other. You know, you go first. No, you go first. And And what I found is that the weaker ones, the Bible talks about a strong man, the weaker ones are pushed to the front. It's kind of like a general at an army uh, on yeah. a battlefield. Uh, the the grunts go to the front and fight it out, and the generals, uh, they stay in the background and give orders. Well, they push all the weaker ones to the front, and the weaker ones come out front. And, and the deeper you work, the bigger and badder they are, I guess is the way to say it, um, the more powerful they seem to be and the more resistant they, you know, are to coming out. They will come out. But, um, you know, I, I wish I was as powerful as Jesus Christ and just say, shut up and get out. <laughs> that would be that'd make yeah. my job really easy, you. you know. Uh, but uh, uh, but I found out that calling them by name works. It just works. Were you able to permanently help that woman from Cuba? I mean, did they leave? Sadly, uh, no. You know, a person, this is something that you also have to be real mindful of. They have to want help. They, people that are very susceptible to be demon possessed, they have to come out of, she was practicing some weird things in her home that she was trying to combine with quote unquote Christianity. And some of these things that she was practicing at home, had a lot of demonic, demonic influence. So you can cast demons out of a person. They can go right back out and invite them back in. Yeah, and that's okay. the thing with demons. You have to invite them in, right? I mean, they don't just randomly go after people. Well, they'll come in where they feel like they've got a right. If mama was a witch and mama used the Ouija board and mama used it enough to where she became demon possessed, and then you're talking about a generational stronghold and demons by they will claim right over a witch's offspring. They will claim the right to possess that child. Um, and uh, demons come in through, they can come in through molestation. Uh, they can come in uh, probably one of the most amazing stories um, dealt with a lady many, many years ago. She ended up being a missionary's wife, ironically. Um she was a teenager and going to a church, and the church, she was dating a boy, and they were having sex outside of marriage. Um, they were 15, 16 years old, and so <clears throat> she was bringing this boy to church with her, and the boy would sit in the pew and mock the, pew, uh, the preacher and make fun of the service, make fun of all the songs under, under his voice, enough for where she could hear him. And so they were in a revival where they went many nights in a row just trying to break things off of their lives. And she got under great conviction. And so she went home that evening and as they got to her house or his house, excuse me, uh, he said, come on, let's go inside and have sex. And she said, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. I don't, I don't want to. I think I need to live my life right. And he reached up and grabbed her and said, it's too late. And when he said that, it was not his voice. He said, it's too late. You're mine. And she locked eyes with him, and she literally watched the demon come out of his eye sockets and float across to hers and go in. And she felt it go down in her. And she started screaming, and she ran. She ran home, ran in the house. Uh, her little sister was in the living room picking up her Barbie dolls and different things. So she immediately got down on her knees to help her sister. She's trying to carry on a conversation with her little sister. And her little sister finally looks up and starts screaming and saying, stop making that ugly face. Stop making that ugly face. Well, that just really freaked her out. So she ran up the stairs and looked in the mirror, and there was a demon's face superimposed over hers. Oh, jeez. So she called 
the youth pastor of the church. Now it's like 10 o'clock at night and she's hysterical. He comes to her house, picks her up and he goes back to the church. They meet with the pastor. She confesses what she's been doing with this boy, told him exactly what happened. And they cast the demons out immediately. They weren't deeply ingrained in her. Obviously they hadn't been there very long. So they came out pretty quickly and she was set free. Um, but demons will come, um, demons will come in through, I had a lady come to my church. She's been about two years ago now and a lady brought her forward and she said, uh, would you pray for my friend? I think she's got a demon. And I, and I looked at him and smiled and I said, well, what makes you think you've got a demon, ma'am? And she said, well, I growled the whole time you were speaking today. Well, you were preaching. I was growling. I laughed and said, well, okay, that, that might be a good indicator. We set up a prayer time a little bit later where we knew everybody would be gone, and they came back to the church that afternoon, about two hours after service was over. And I met with them, and I said, okay, how long do you think you've been demon-possessed? She said, almost all my life. And I said, well, demons usually come through trauma to the body, uh, somebody in your family that was a witch or a warlock or somebody that played with tarot cards or Ouija boards or whatever. And I said, also, the trauma could be molestation. When I said that, both eyes, she looked to her right and left, and I immediately picked up on it. And I said, hey, everybody, there was about six or seven people standing around us. And I said, why don't you all go back to the back part of the church for a moment? Just let this lady and I talk. I said, okay, tell me about it. She said, well, my grandfather started molesting me when I was four, and he molested me all the way up to I was 17. When I was 16, uh, he got me pregnant. I went to my mother, who was his daughter, and said, Mom, Grandpa's been having sex with me, and I'm pregnant. She called her a lying whore and took her to an abortion clinic and had an abortion. She found out later that her mother was molested, molested by her dad, uh, which would have been this girl's grandfather, That's was terrible. molested by him probably up until he took over and started molesting the granddaughter. I said, well, did you, did you ever even think, um, you know, I said, well, it's, you know, it's a good thing he didn't kill you. And she said, oh, he did kill someone. I said, how do you know? She said, well, he took me to the barn one day to have sex with me, laid me down on the dirt floor in the barn next to a little girl that was dead. And I said, well, how do you know she was dead? She said, well, there were bugs crawling out of her eyes and her mouth and her nose. Oh, geez. That's terrible. And I said, I said, did you ever think about calling the police? And she said, my grandfather was the sheriff. So, you know, the demon possession with this little girl came from a great amount of suppression uh, and a tremendous amount of repeated trauma. And more than likely, the man was demon possessed that was doing the molesting. And the demons transferred as he was molesting her. We've seen that many, many, many times. If you ever, um, that's terrible. That's a man. That's probably one of the worst stories I've ever heard. Uh, did, did you ever um, ask one of these people what does it feel like to be possessed? I, I'm sure it's probably not a conversation most people want to have. But have ever has anyone ever told you what it feels like to be possessed? They feel helpless. They feel um, they can tell when the spirits take control and come forward. <clears throat> I can tell you. I wished everybody in your audience had a front row seat when an entity from those other dimensions comes forward and starts trying to take over the eyes and the mouth and start working the body. They have a very difficult time when they come forward. When I command them, come forward now and tell me who you are, they'll start taking over the eyes. I've seen the eyes spin in opposite directions and one be looking up and one be looking down while the spirit's trying to adjust the strangest thing you've ever seen in your life. Okay. Very, very bizarre. And even people that have doubted me in the past, if they were there when I'm working, they leave going, Oh my God, it's real. Isn't it? There really is the, you know, there's no doubt here. I say, no, there's no doubt whatsoever. Uh, but back to your question. Um, it's really bizarre. You get a lot of different answers. Uh, had a man, uh, come again to one of our services and I looked up and there was about five of my great big guys holding on to a guy in the front of our building, right? Not very far from the front of the stage. 
So I quickly walked over there and said, guys, what are you doing? They said, this guy's team obsessed. And I looked over at him. His eyes were rolled back in his head and he was growling. And so I stepped in and put my hand on him, started to pray for him. And he turned and started walking. Now he's dragging five grown men with him. This guy's probably a buck 45. Okay. These guys are all linebackers. These guys are all, you know, they're my posse, man. They're, they're big grown, you know, they're, they're all 225, 250, 275, 300. He's dragging all of them up the aisle. He's headed out the door and these guys are pulling on him and their, their feet are sliding. It's just the strangest thing. And so I step around them and I stop them and I actually had to put my hands on a couple of them and yell and say, stop, leave the man alone. And so they all looked at me like, pastor, you know, what are you doing? And I I said, just leave him alone. And I said, now you, sir, you don't move another step in Jesus name until I give you permission. And he stopped. And I said, do you know where you're at? He said, yes, sir. I said, you know, you're in a church that has the power, right? He said, that's right. I said, you know, this particular church operates in authority and we have the power to cast all these spirits out. He said, that's right. I said, I have a question for you. I said, do you want all the demons to leave? He said, I want most of them to leave, but I kind of like some of them. Oh, geez. And I said, well, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to leave here, and you're not coming back until you're ready to be completely free because we don't play that game here. Did he I said, ever- I'm not going to get rid of some of them and leave you partially bound. Do you understand me? He said, yes, sir, I understand. I said, you know I love you. He said, yes. I said, I'm not trying to hurt you but I don't play games here. I'm either going to get rid of all of them or we're not doing this. He said, okay, thank you very much. He turned around and walked off into the dark. Did he ever come back? Never saw him again. I wonder why he liked some of the demons. That's a weird comment to make. Oh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I've never been demon possessed, so I don't, you know, I'm, I'm sure that they were probably in the line of lust and pleasure and, and, uh, fornication, uh, uh, you know, could have been rape, murder. It could, could be anything that gives them a sensation of power. I mean, these people have power, bro. <laughs> I mean, I know preachers that have had people float a good 12 to 16 inches off the floor while they're trying to cast the spirits out. Literally levitate, come off the floor. Their feet, the bottom of their feet are 12 to 16 inches off the floor. I've, I've had them pick up entire pews and spin them around. Uh, I mean, a man on his knees just reached over and grabbed a pew and just hoisted it up. I'm talking about a 16-foot pew that weighs 350. He's on his knees leaning over, just picks it up and spins it completely around, sets it down. Was there anyone you couldn't help? Was there anyone that you couldn't cast it out? It didn't work? Yes, and I'll tell you why. Uh, It's not because we don't have the power and we don't have the authority. We're given that by God. I wasn't able to help because they didn't want help. They, They weren't ready to give up. I dealt with a young man that was six foot two, and I had three or four uh, encounters with him where we spent anywhere from two to five hours each time casting demons out. But he would go right back to the heroin, right back to – and many people are uh, demon-possessed by getting involved with hallucinogens. Man, (laughs) Um, a lot of demon-possessed people that I've dealt with are former drug addicts. And uh, there's something about the mixture of of mind-altering drugs and certain genres of rock and roll that are just a really – a deadly mixture. Have you ever heard of uh, DMT? Yes. It's called the spirit drug. No, I'm sorry. No, I thought you said DMC. The band. No, no, no. <laughs> D- it's uh, DMT, and uh, no. people smoke it. It's called the spirit drug, and and I and I've been watching a lot of videos on this DMT that people smoke, and DMT is naturally in your brain, um, and people theorize that when they have near death experiences or when they end up, you know, someone dies and says, I went to heaven and I saw God, they think it's a release of this DMT even in your brain. Um, that causes that you to feel that way, but you can smoke it. You, you buy this DMT, you can smoke it. And it used to be legal up until 
couple of years ago. Uh, but one, it's called the spirit drug. And the one thing that's interesting when you smoke DMT, if you ever go, go to YouTube and type in DMT experiences and just listen to people talk. And one thing that you'll find is they seem to, I don't know if it's in their mind or if it's in reality, they seem to end up in the spirit realm and they seem to either speak with God or they have some sort of spirit guide uh, that they talk to and they're shown something about their life. Um, it, it's really bizarre. Uh, and that's what made me think of it when you were talking about drugs and hallucinogens, because this DMT is, uh, I think it's called the spirit drug, where you end up going to the spirit realm. You end up becoming, a lot of people describe uh, shooting up into space after they smoke it, and they become like a ball of light or a ball of energy. And they run into... I guess spirits. Um, but anyway, I guess that's off topic. It made me think of that when you were talking about hallucinogens. Well, out of body experiences are very real. I, I actually know men of great prayer that uh, after knowing them for five or 10 years and they find that they can trust me, have told me that they get into intense prayer meetings and they're alone and it's in for the fourth or fifth or sixth hour of prayer. I wouldn't know because I can't pray that long, <laughs> but uh, yeah. uh, they 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 just give themselves to it and they leave their body and they've traveled to other parts of the earth. Uh, they've traveled uh, into the deeper parts and regions of the ocean. Um, they have left their body and met angels and demons. Um, uh, one particular man that's a great friend of mine, phenomenal man of God that just has unbelievable experiences. And, uh, uh, I mean, there's, he's told me things. There's no way he could know about me. Unbelievable. Okay. Uh, mind blowing. He has left his body and come back and, and it took his body. He was numb all over his arms and uh, legs felt like lead. And he had to lay there and just wait for his body to wake back up after he came back. And uh, I know that sounds a little crazy. It's probably a little out there for a lot of people. Um, but, you know, Paul said, I met a man so many years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. Talked about going into the heavenlies. I've, I've met a number of people that have had near-death experiences and left their bodies. And, and I meet them very often because they're seeking out somebody that understands. You know, hey, I had this experience. Can you help me understand it? Yeah, kind of. Do you correlate that with astral projection? Have you ever looked into astral projection? Yeah, I have. I, I'm very familiar with the term. Um, I think it's close to one and the same. I think the danger of astral projection is uh, I, if you're going to do that and leave your body, you need, uh, first of all, if you're doing it kind of, I don't want to sound too religious here, but in an unauthorized way where you really don't have, uh, you're just experimenting and you're playing around with it and, and you're trying to leave your body and it's not something that God does for you or, you know, you, you're just kind of out there experimenting and you may not have your angels with you at the time when you do something like that, I think there's an element of danger there. And then what I, I mean there you. is I understand what you're saying. Yeah. 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 No, I understand yeah. exactly what you're saying. It's fascinating. I think we can do more as humans than we realize. I think um, I always laugh at the caveman version. You know, people say we came from caveman. I think we're the dumbed down version of what we used to be. Um, and I think the human body can do a lot of things. The human mind can do a lot of things. Well, you don't have to agree with this, but the world <clears throat> is upside down right now. Uh, Adam and Eve, you know, a man is body, soul, and spirit. And a lot of your Hebrew sages believed that Adam and Eve were spirit first. And when they fell, they became body first or flesh first. Um, the Bible says that Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden fruit. And they realized they were naked. Now, I, I don't think Adam was stupid. He helped in the act of creation. He helped name the animals. I think he probably was one of the most brilliant beings that ever lived. He didn't have any insecurities. I mean, his dad never told him he was stupid or a loser. So I think he was a brilliant being. Um, many Hebrew sages believe that they were living spirit first and they were engulfed in light. We're, we're now called, the ch Christians are called children of light. 
And he was engulfed in an immense amount of light because his spirit was the first thing you encountered when you came toward him. And when he ate of the forbidden fruit, it reversed, the light went out, and he could see that he was naked. Yeah, a lot of ancient texts talk about that. I'm I'm surprised you brought that up because I've wondered about that. A lot of ancient texts talk about him being um, a, a being of light. And you're right. I mean, it, I I guess I didn't mean cut you off, but I, I just find that fascinating because I've read that in ancient texts, and I thought, oh, that's weird. I wonder why why it's referred that way. Uh, but I'm sorry, Randy, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you know, it's uh, it's I believe that that's what happened. I believe that when the light went inward or he was no longer it flipped upside down the world turned upside down on that day and he was no longer spirit first but flesh first uh i think that you know it it was obviously devastating for all of creation and i think that when jesus came and died that he was trying to write that and i believe that there are people that spend a lot of time in in the presence of god that have uh those experiences, spirit first experiences. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's really fascinating. What What is the most terrifying demonic encounter you've ever had that just terrified you? <laughs> Are you ready for this? I don't know if you're ready. Okay. Uh, I was in my late 20s and well, probably the first one, the, the very first encounter uh, was probably the most terrifying because I didn't expect it. And I, I, you know, I believed in God. I just didn't know that this other realm existed. So, but I won't go, I won't go to that one. I'm going to go to one that happened to me um, in my late 20s, 28, 29. I was a very young pastor and I had preached that night and brought my wife home. Our oldest son was one at the time. My wife took him back to his bedroom and was getting him ready for bed. And I walked back through the apartment that we lived in and I walked to the front door and I turned the deadbolt on the door. And when I did, I heard a voice and it said, I'm not going to let you sleep tonight. The voice was so clear and it was in my head, but it was so clear that I laughed out loud and went, ha, yeah, right. And I knew it was from the enemy. And I turned very quickly because I scared myself when, when I said, yeah, right out loud, it startled me. And I walked very quickly back to the bedroom and walked into where my wife was. And I was unbuttoning my white shirt. I was down to almost the last button, uh, pulling it off as a white dress shirt. And I said, honey, you're not going to believe what a demon just said to me in the living room. She said, what? said, it told me it wasn't going to let me sleep tonight. And when I said that, our doorbell rang right then, Wes. So I walk back through the house and turn on some lights and the apartment and turn on some lights. And I turn the deadbolt and open the door and there's a demon possessed woman standing there and her husband's behind her. And he's like, pastor, could you let us in? We need to talk to you. And I said, okay, come on in. And he opens his shirt and he's got claw marks and blood on his chest. And he said, the demons in my wife went crazy and attacked me about 30, 40 minutes ago. And we didn't know where else to come but to you. We don't know of anybody else that deals with this stuff. Now, I'm mad. I just have to be honest. I'm mad. I'm ticked off. I'm thinking, man, whoever this was that spoke to me, they're going for broke. And I'm, (laughs) this is going to sound really bad, but. You have to understand that people that try to do the work of the kingdom, they're only human. So I'm like, man, I'm not letting this happen. I'm, I, this dude threw down on me, whoever he is. And I, honestly, Wes, at that moment, I was so mad in warfare terminology. I was so mad at the demon that I was being a little selfish. I really didn't care about the woman at the moment. And, you know, they both said, you know, she said, I'm just as afraid as he is. Because what I did to him, and and he said, man, I can't be alone with her tonight. So I called him into another room, and I said, here's what we're going to (laughs) do. We're going to take her back out to your house. And when she gets out of the car, I want you to shut the door, and we're going to drive off. We'll leave her out there tonight, and we'll deal with this tomorrow. 
I'm embarrassed to admit that. And there's probably you're probably gonna get a lot of criticism. <laughs> you know, who was this selfish no, no. idiot that you had on? Okay. But I was tired and just being human, you know. And uh, so they had a like an an old white pinto, and his brother was with him. His tr- brother was driving the pinto, so we got our game plan together, and we drove out. Now I had seen, physically seen, many demons in this old two-story farmhouse that they lived in out in the middle of nowhere, bro. And it was, it was up an old gravel driveway that circled right in front of the house. And they didn't have a lot of money. And so they had old towels hanging in the window for she, uh, and sheets for, for curtains. It looked hideous. Okay. It really, really looked bad. All right. And I had seen many demons when I first went over there and met with them and talked with them. I would see black flashes along the floor running around the couch, and I kept asking them, you know, how many cats do you have? We don't have cats. What do you mean you don't have cats, you know? I was seeing them in my peripheral vision, and you mainly see demonic activity or angelic activity in your peripheral vision, not straight ahead, but in your peripheral. So I kept seeing that, very busy. Anyway, so we drive out there. I'm in the back seat of this Pinto. This guy has got his wife on his lap in the front seat of the Pinto and his brother, who's like six foot two, 280, he's driving this little Pinto and I'm sitting in the back seat. So we get out to the farmhouse, we pull up, he stops, he opens the door and we pretend like we're all going to get out. She steps out and she's just about to let go of the door and she turns around and starts laughing at us and she says, oh, no, you don't. You're not leaving me out here with them. She was referring to the demons in the house. And she jumps back face first into the car and she lands on her husband's lap. Her her elbows and forearms land on his lap and she's got him by the knees. And she's making all these weird noises. You're not leaving me here with them. You're not leaving me. And I'm like, drive. And I'm calling this guy by name. I don't want to call his name but I'm, I'm i'm i'll call him mark drive mark drive and so she looks up at the driver and makes eye contact with him this guy 280 six foot two six foot three goes absolutely stark raving crazy and starts bouncing like a ping pong ball all over the front seat over the over, over hitting the windshield slapping the steering wheel screaming they're choking me they're choking me they're choking me So I reach forward and put my hand on his shoulder and say, in Jesus' name, and he completely relaxes. He says, they just stopped. And I called her by name, and uh, I said, get out of the car. We'll come back and get you in the morning. No, you're not leaving me here. And so anyway, she looks back up at this guy. He goes absolutely nuts again. This time he says, they just went in me. They went down my throat. They're in me. They're in me. He starts screaming, very high-pitched scream. So I don't know if you know much about Pintos, but they're bucket seats and they lean forward. So I had to find the latch. Now, this guy's bouncing all over. The the whole car is rocking. I get my forearm up against the seat. I find the latch on the side. I push the seat forward. I shove him up against the steering wheel. I find the handle on his door, pop it open, and I crawl out with the car bouncing everywhere, reach in and grab him, drag him out of the car. He's flailing. He's hitting me. He's screaming at the top of his lungs. I lean the seat forward again, throw him in the back seat. I'm not a big guy. I have to curl his legs up, shove him in. If you know about a Pinto, their their seats aren't very big. Push it in, close close the seat back, jump in. And I looked at her and said, get in. (laughs) So she crawls in the car. Now her face is like three and a half inches away from my face. She's sitting on her husband's lap. It's a little car, okay? And it's a standard. So I put it in first. I start down the driveway. I've driven standards since I was 16. I shift into second. I'm not kidding you. The shifter and all of the linkages come out of the floor. And I'm holding the shifter and all the linkages hanging like octopus tentacles. (laughs) I'm looking down at the shifter. I'm stuck in second gear. So I'm driving down the highway in the middle of the night with this guy bouncing all over the back of the car, screaming at the top of his lungs. She's laughing. She's three and a half inches away from my face. And I'm driving down the highway in the middle of the night, no streetlights, middle of nowhere, 
trying to get back to civilization. And the fear in that car was insane. I finally get to a, a large parking lot. This happened in Stillwater, Minnesota, and they just opened up the very first large grocery store in America. It was called Cub Foods. They had a massive parking lot. It would almost be like a super Walmart today. And um, so I pulled up in that parking lot, uh, stopped the car, got out, pulled the seat forward, drug this guy out of the car and leaned him up against the car. And I put my hand on his head and I said, you come out of this man in Jesus name. And he started vomiting and lunged forward face first. He was just about to hit the asphalt and I caught his jacket about where shoulder was. I caught his jacket and just yanked like I was trying to pull, start a lawnmower. And I spun him around and he hit of his head instead of hitting his face he hit the back of his head and rolled over on his side and started vomiting he vomited for 20 or 30 seconds and rolled around looked at me and said they're gone he looked extremely relieved i said get back in the car he got in the car i got in the driver's seat drove on to my house the minute we pulled up we all got out to go back into my apartment and the guy, the guy that I just cast the demons out jumped in the driver's seat and drove off and left me standing there with this demon-possessed woman and her husband. I'll stop there, bro, because it just gets crazy. But but No, no, no. I, I, you can't stop there. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we go in, and I'm trying to convince them, is there anybody can come get you? I'm still mad. I, I'm still wanting to go to bed. Now it's... Three thirty, four o'clock in the morning. I'm, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm not gonna let this spirit win. I'm not, or spirits. I'm not gonna let them win. Can, is everybody come get you? And can we deal with this tomorrow? And they're like, we're not leaving you. And we don't know where to go. We're terrified. She said, look, I'm afraid of me, and I'm, I'm definitely afraid of the demons that are in me and me. And we're not leaving you. And you know, I, I try to convince them. Could you just? find somewhere to go tonight and come back tomorrow. And they said, no, we're just, we, we don't want to leave you. We're afraid. And I said, well, come on in. So they came in the house. I'm still trying to figure out how to get them out of my house. And I'm talking with them. I know this is going to sound really crazy, but all of a sudden when I was breathing, um, it seemed like there was less and less oxygen in the air. Now, I'm not somebody to lose my composure. I, I used to work in an emergency room. I handled a lot of stress. I've, I've had many people die in my hands uh, doing CPR on them, different things like that. Um, so I don't get – I don't overreact to situations. And so as, as I'm breathing, uh, there's less and less oxygen in the air. And I'm looking across the room at them, and they look perfectly fine. But I'm like with each breath, and I was not hyperventilating. I that that was one of my jobs, taking vitals. I had how many breaths a minute, what's their pulse, what's their blood pressure. I had to do all of that. So I'm very well that very well aware that you're supposed to take 16 breaths a minute. So I'm consciously thinking, okay, I'm breathing normal, but there's no oxygen in the air. And so I sat there. They didn't know what was going on with me, but I could tell that something dark was going on in the room. <clears throat> and I got to the point to where I just could not catch a breath. And I literally turned and lunged toward the phone. This is back in the days before cell phones. And lunged toward the phone and grabbed it off the wall and dialed a preacher that I knew that was just a real warfare type preacher. And it's 4.10, 4.20 in the morning, something like that. And somebody answers on the other end and they're like, hello. And I called the guy by name and I said, pray for me. I'm dealing with a demon possessed woman. <clears throat> I can't breathe, pray. And he said, well, I'm not who you think I am. I'm another preacher that just happens to be covering for this guy's church and I'm staying at his house. And he said, but I'll pray. So he started praying. Almost immediately, the oxygen came back into the room and I could breathe. And I told him, I said, it's okay now, I can breathe. And he said, well, you're, you're in some real intense warfare. And what I want you to do is, do you have any olive oil in the house? And I said, yes. And so the Bible talks about anointing with oil. So he said, get the oil, pray over it, ask God to bless it. And then he said, I want you to anoint every door and every window in your house and command the spirits to get out. 
So I spent the next 40 minutes going around and dabbing small bits of oil on the doors and the windows and uh, the window openings, every opening in the house. And then I stood in the living room and commanded every spirit of darkness to leave the house. Um, and uh, when I got finished, the the room felt clear. They were still sitting there. She obviously was still being possessed, but, but they, they go, what do we do next? Wes, I looked out the window and the sun was starting to come up. And I said, hang on a minute. And I walked back to my bedroom and woke my wife up. I said, I'm so sorry to do this, but I need for you to go get in the bed with our son. And uh, I'll be in in a minute. And so when I knew she was out of our bedroom, I told the couple, I said, go back there and get in my bed and lay down. Let's try to get some sleep. And as I was going to sleep, the sun was coming up. <laughs> I was up all night, man. So the demon and, was uh, right. You weren't going to sleep that night. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't sleep a wink, man. I didn't sleep a wink. I was wore out. Um, this lady had very strange influence. She would, she by herself doubled the size of my church attendance by herself. She would walk into bars on Saturday night and say, all of you are coming to church with me in the morning. You got to meet this guy. You got to meet this preacher. You got to meet him. <laughs> the next morning she'd walk in with 15, 20 people. Yeah, that's amazing. Do you, and, did and, you, can I ask you a real quick question? Did, did you ever once think to yourself, I should have been a truck driver? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I told you this before. I was a nightclub entertainer, and I had a radical experience. That's how I ended up in the ministry. But, um, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've thought many, many times that I should be doing something else, you know. But... When you face the reality that there's a lot of people out there that are hurting, and if you're if you don't do it, who's going to? You know, I'm 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 working with a doctor right now that has many 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 patients, and they contacted me and said, you know, I think some of the people I'm dealing with are demon possessed, and I need you to help me understand. And we're actually going through classes, and I'm teaching her about these things so that she, you know, will be a, a little more aware because I think she's calling some things demonic that are not. And I, you know, how, how to be aware. Yeah, no, well, you know what? And I want to, and I don't want to keep you cause I know you, you have things you're doing tonight with the church, but I, I would love to have you back, Randy. I know you're going to start a podcast and I'd love to have you back to promote it. I really enjoy talking with you. Uh, would you come back for a part two? Because I'd like to know how you got into this whole thing. You know what? Because I mean, it seems like a lot of nonsense you have to deal with, and you got to have a passion for it. If you don't have the passion for it, I mean, some I know there's a a ton more stories that you have. Uh, the boys playing with the Ouija board, and um, I mean, so many other stories. I would love to have you back. Would you Would you be willing to come back for a part two? Sure, I would. And it's been a real pleasure being on your show. Yeah, I really enjoyed talking with you. I know it's a little different topic, but um, you answered a lot of questions I've wondered about for a long time, and I would love to have you back. But I, I and if you come back for part two, I got to hear the story how you got into this. You know, because you don't <laughs> okay. just fall into it. I mean, there's, no, there I has didn't. to be something that <laughs> happened. And sure, I would love to come back. I really would, and I consider it an honor and a privilege to be on your show. And man, you're doing a great job. I mean that top shelf. Uh, thanks for the kind of words, Randy. It means a lot. Thank you again for coming on.